Hey, music junkies, professor of rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. If music, if you love it, if it's a part of your life, you're gonna to wanna to subscribe below. Hit the bell so you always get our daily content celebrating the best of the rock era. You can also check us out on Patreon as we've added a bunch of exclusives and a lot of benefits there. The link for that is below. Now it's time to jump back in and do a follow-up episode of 90s Hidden Gems. Five seemingly passed over songs from the 90s that deserve another listen right now. Let's get right into it. Number five, If You Could Only See by Tonic. The third and final single from the band's debut 1996 album, Lemon Parade, but the song was not originally thought to be a potential single. The first two singles from Lemon Parade had received only modest success. The lead, Open Up Your Eyes, peaked at number two on the mainstream rock chart. Pretty good there, but it stalled at number 68 on the Hot 100. Second single, Casual Affair, made it to number eight on the mainstream rock, but uh, it failed to cross over. Album sales were moving quite slowly, and if you could only see, then an album cut became the topic of discussion as a possible third single. In essence, the next single would have to save the album from becoming a disappointment. If you could only see the way she loved If You Could Only See was composed by lead singer Emerson Hart. Now, I had a chance to interview him about the song and its inspiration. It's quite interesting. Here's what he said about it. I wrote it quite a few years before the band was even really a full band. And uh, it was my first marriage. I, my mother didn't want me to get married because I was 21, which she was absolutely right, <laughs> it turns out. But yeah. uh, the last thing I said to her when I was talking to her on the phone, because we didn't speak for about a year and a half or two years after that, as I said, if you could only see the way she loves me, then maybe you would understand why I have to do what I have to do. And hung up the phone and it literally was within a couple hours, I just kind of formulated it and it came right out. It was very quick and I put it away. And then we started putting it into the set when we were playing at the Mint and other places. And that song for some reason seemed to be the one that stuck. And I wasn't even really quite sure to put it on the record because even really? recording it, yeah, like it, it just didn't, it didn't feel right to me, mm -hmm. um, but I'm so glad that I was wrong on that. <laughs> I'm so glad. Um, well, number one hit on the rock charts, top 10 mm. pop hit. I mean, and the most played song in 1997. It was everywhere. It was everywhere. And I still hear it at Home Depot every day. If yep. <laughs> so it's okay. If you could only see proof that the third time is indeed a charm, ultimately becoming the saving grace is Tonic's breakthrough hit. If you could only see State on the Billboard Hot 100 Airplay chart for more than a year, a whopping 63 weeks. In fact, it peaked at number 11 as the album's third and unplanned final single. The song zoomed all the way to number one of the Billboard Mainstream Rock chart and it shot to number three on the U.S. Alternative Airplay chart and number one on the Alternative chart in Canada. If you could only see is another gem from the 90s that resonates on a very personal level because the song came from a very personal place. Maybe As the saying goes, true love is in the eyes of the beholder. If you can see it, hopefully you can understand it. I'm drowning in your eyes. I'm floating out to sea, helpless on the restless tide that flows between you and me. The dreamy chorus of Ephraim Lewis's haunting and unheralded 1992 single, Drowning in Your Eyes, our number four song today, from his one and only album release, Skin. Ephraim Lewis was a young English singer-songwriter on the brink of stardom before suddenly dying in a bizarre episode in West Hollywood, California in 94. Ephraim Lewis was dubbed the British Michael Jackson by the owners of the Access Recording Studio in Sheffield, England, who discovered him. Um, he definitely had a soul-stirring gospel voice that he could also tone down to like a seductive patter. He was immensely talented. I mean, just listen to his incredible vocal performance on Drowning in Your Eyes. He had the looks and the charisma that the music industry just salivates for. He'd actually moved to California to work with the uh, famed producer, Glenn Ballard. Kevin Bacon, one of the two owners of the Access Studio that found Ephraim, believed that he had the qualities to become a massive pop star. 
Annie Roseberry, a former executive at Electra Entertainment in London, concurred. Um, Roseberry, who had worked with U2's Bono, was equally impressed with the talent of Ephraim Lewis, claiming that she had never worked with uh, someone as good as a singer as Ephraim, probably never would again. Hence the lofty comparison to Michael Jackson. The tragic death of Ephraim is shrouded in controversy after Ephraim fell from the balcony of an apartment building while being chased by the police. The official police report on the incident stated that several calls came into police dispatch saying that there was a naked man running around the apartment complex acting crazy. Police investigated the scene and attempted to subdue Ephraim and take him into custody, but he resisted and ran to the top of the building to escape stabbing himself repeatedly with shards of broken glass while fleeing. Uh, to the police and the onlookers, Ephraim appeared to be out of his mind. He fell off the balcony of the fourth floor and onto the courtyard below. He was tased by police three times before that. Uh, that's what it uh, says in the, the record. Ephraim died several hours later in an LA hospital from fatal head injuries. Now, it was labeled a suicide, and there are people on the inside of Ephraim's closed circle that believe that... Uh, he was tortured by personal and professional issues and that he chose to leap to his death. Some claim it was an accident, while others have blamed the LAPD for escalating Ephraim's manic behavior. Any way you slice it, Ephraim's death was shocking as he was only 26 years old and he had such promise and like so many senseless tragedies like this, we're left to wonder what could have been. But Ephraim Lewis left the world with a wonderful album to cherish that features the song Drowning in Your Eyes, a song that you should listen to immediately after this video. It's amazing. It's an incredible 90s gem that deserves rediscovering as well as an introduction into future generations. Number three, My Own Worst Enemy by Lit, one of the bands that broke out of the very popular Orange County alternative rock scene in the late 90s. It was the lead single from Lit's second album, A Place in the Sun, that sold over 1.5 million copies. The song was written by the Pop-Off Brothers, lead singer AJ, and lead guitarist Jeremy. This riotous 90s gem about waking up in the morning from a drunken stupor full of regret after a night of acting the fool, as they say, the narrator pleads to forget about the things he said when he was drunk. He didn't mean to do it. It was the alcohol talking. Can we forget about the things I said when I my Own Worst Enemy is a divulgence of AJ's history of disorderly conduct where he got himself in trouble because of heavy drinking, including getting arrested for public nudity. AJ had a hard time keeping his pants on in the 90s, except when he passed out on a front lawn, sleeping with his clothes on as he reveals in My Own Worst Enemy. AJ admitted that he was actually naked when he sang My Own Worst Enemy in the studio during the recording session. Here's what the brothers told me about the song during an exclusive POR interview. Now, my, before I show you that, I want to mention our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, which I now wear exclusively. I mean, I've just fallen in love with all these different frames that I handpicked myself at their website. Low in price, uh, the process to select my style and customize them was just fun, very easy. They shipped them right out to me. Click on the link below to do the same thing. They also have some very cool sunglasses, and here is the band Lit. We used to have a warehouse that we rented in Anaheim, and we, it was our man cave. You know, it was all vintage couches and a couple video games. Felt and, like this. And a bar. <laughs> and, and, uh, Hot and just vibey. But we, uh, we, and we used to just go, you know, three, four nights a week, we'd grab a 12-pack of cheap beer, and we would just go in there and hang out and, and just jam and write songs and... Um, so it kind of it kind of came out. I just started playing the riff, and AJ kind of was humming the melody. And the funny thing is, we wrote. He had a he had scribbled down in his car. He used to have this this old Buick that didn't the gas gauge was broken, and he'd have to write his mileage down on the little scrap paper <laughs> but, so he wouldn't run out of gas. And he happened to write. Um, it's no surprise to me. I am my own worst enemy, and, it, and he had written down there. So we you know we built it off of that. We wrote the song in like ten minutes. And um, T-Bone, who he was our tour manager for a lot of years, and now he runs uh, House of Blues in Anaheim. But he, he's like our best friend from school, and he was like our main dude, you know. He didn't like it. So we were, 
we were nervous <laughs> to play it. So we actually didn't play it for a couple of shows because even though it was new and we liked it, we felt self-conscious about it because Tebow yeah. didn't like it. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, yeah. then the first time we played it live, everybody, the reaction was something that we hadn't felt. Um, it was, you, could se- you could sense that people were like, uh-oh, there's something happening now. And still to this day, I mean, it, it's, it's crossed over now. There's country artists playing it in their, oh, yeah. at their shows. We've, we've, we went out on stage at um, the stage, Stagecoach Festival where Coachella is, and we went out and played it with Dustin Lynch, and you know, 50,000 yeah, 50, so people fun, went man. ape shit. Where did that self-deprecation come from? Was it just kind of hanging out? and We still live it. You yeah. know what I mean? That song, we could write that song tomorrow. Is it? I mean, that's a little different. We're a little more careful now that we have kids and families and businesses. Right. And but you know, we get out on the road and we become those those you know, early twenties punks oh, yeah. again. And um, but yeah, you know, the fact that I had a broken gas gauge and I knew I could run out of gas at any time. Who knows what was going through my mind that day? And I just like wrote that little you know little thing down. I kicked the living shit out of me, and <laughs> and I was just <laughs> we're always doing things where we're just like, man, we still our own worst enemies on you know regular basis. And I think that's something that people relate to and. Oh, yeah. Maybe that's what part of it, you know, aside from it being infectious hook wise, melodic wise, you know, melody wise, but it was something that people, you know, continue to live. College kids, that's seems to be, a, you know, definitely a lot of college people that have graduated and moved on that are just like, that was my college anthem or my yeah. high school. And it's cool, man, because like that was our college too. The tune shot straight to number one in the Billboard Modern Rock tracks and remained at uh, on the top for 12 weeks. Also received the Billboard Music Award for Biggest Modern Rock Song of 1999. Number two, Plowed by Sponge. Remember this band? Man, you know, this little ditty from 94 came up on my playlist recently, and I gotta tell you, I was reminded of how awesome this song is. I mean, I was transported right back to my senior year of high school. After that random play on my playlist that same day, found myself singing the song over and over again. couldn't get that line from the chorus out of my mind in a world of human wreckage. That line pretty much sums up 2020. And Mike Cross's infectious guitar riff, lead singer Vinnie Dombrowski singing those prophetic words, I was plowed into the sound as the song goes. Now, hailing from Detroit, Michigan, the band Sponge hit their apex with their second album release, Rotting Pinata, that came out in 94. It had that iconic album cover that so many years later, I can still recall it perfectly. Now, Plowed was the second single released from that gold-selling record, and it's one of those 90s gems that decades after its heyday, it still stands the test of time. Vinnie Dombrowski, the frontman for Sponge, has such a cool vocal style. It naturally mingles like punk rock urgency with the subcultural angst of grunge. Hang on. I spoke with Vinny about the creation of Plowed, and here's what he had to share with us. That song nearly wrote itself. It's just one of those tunes, you know, that there wasn't a lot of um, uh, thinking or second guessing with it, you know what I mean? It was just like, I literally wrote it without a guitar in my hands, you know, the melody. Um, I was at home uh, hanging out, and the melody came, I went in the house and grabbed the guitar, and knocked it all out with all the lyrics pretty much in place. And then we record, went to record that same night. This is before we got you know, involved with a label or anything like right, that. Right, right, right. You know what I mean? And then uh, one of the uh, guitar players at the time, Mike Cross, he put that iconic riff on it and at the intro, man, in the solo, and there it is, you know? It yeah. was really that, that quick. The day I, I wrote the words and the, the chords, um, I called my buddy up, Tim, who owns a recording studio, and he's on the road with us once in a while, Tim Paddle. He's produced uh, a number of our records. I called him up and said, well, I gotta record this song. And he said, well, come on in tonight. You know, We went to the studio that, that night, you know, and you can talk to tons of bands that spend days and weeks making a record, man. You know, And for some bands, it, that's how they operate, and I respect that, but for us at that time, it was like, boom, let's record this thing. And we recorded it the same night, man. And the version uh, recorded from that night is on that record. Well, the thing about it is, is that's why, for me, that's why it's so powerful is because it's raw. It's the immediacy. In the moment. The immediacy factor of music, man. It's just like, 
yeah, totally in the moment. That's the best stuff. And you can't, I can't sit and go, you know, I'm going to work on that kind of thing again. I don't even know yeah. what that is. Plowed was a number five hit on the Billboard Modern Rock Tracks chart. That was number nine on the U.S. Album Rock Tracks chart. And it narrowly missed making the Billboard Hot 100 pop chart. It stalled at number 41. But the song was played on radio all the time, and I think it was much bigger than its chart position. And number one, Special by Garbage. The innovative quartet called Garbage began with three studio veterans, Duke Erickson, Steve Marker, and Butch Vig. Butch, of course, well-known in the music industry for producing Nirvana's landmark album, Nevermind. In 94, Butch, Steve, and Duke were producing remixes for heavy hitters like U2, Depeche Mode, and Nine Inch Nails when they had aspirations of forming a band of their own and were looking for a female singer who had a strong and unique presence. Boy, did they ever find it. They found precisely the right vocalist in the boldly entrancing Shirley Manson. She was fronting an alternative rock band in Scotland called Angelfish at that time. Despite what Manson called a disastrous first audition, the foursome came together and Shirley gave them a true indication of her tenacious command of the stage. I was so intrigued by Shirley Manson from the moment I heard the song Vow from their debut album and I saw her fiery red hair on the music video, kind of fell in love. But then I heard Shirley deliver the line from Val, I came around to tear your little world apart and break your soul apart. I, I was both intimidated and mesmerized, head over heels smitten for who I would call the goddess of post-grunge. Garbage has created many cool tracks over their six studio albums, the song Special from the band's second album, version 2.0 in 98, is a tune that I feel has really held up lyrically and melodically. It's the garbage composition that reverberates universal understanding. We've all been there. We can empathize with Shirley singing about being infatuated with someone that she thought was special, only to discover that the person she was enamored with is nothing special, moving like a sheep in the herd. Do you have an opinion? A mind of your own. I thought you were special. I thought you should know. I just can't imagine a strong, independent spirit like Shirley Manson ending up with a mechanical pedestrian as a love interest or a companion like the one depicted in Special. But uh, who's counting here? Shirley has a snarl in her vocal on Special that gives the song, you know, that punk rock attitude reminiscent of the great pretender singer, Chrissy Hine. There's a wink to Chrissy in the song's refrain with the lyric, We Were the Talk of the Town, which harkens the 1980 Pretenders tune, Talk of the Town. Shirley wanted to make sure that Chrissy was totally cool with her using the Talk of the Town lyric in the outro for special, so she called Chrissy and asked for her permission to use the line. Chrissy not only gave Shirley verbal approval, she also faxed her written consent to Butch's Smart Studios in Madison, Wisconsin, where Garbage was recording. One of the really cool elements of the arrangement of Special is the use of an old tried-and-true 12-string Rickenbacker guitar for the opening riff, and then bringing it back at the end of the first chorus. An interesting production contrast to the state-of-the-art 48-track digital system and 24-bit Pro Tools rig that the band used to record the song. Although Special ran out of steam at number 52 on the Billboard Hot 100, it had considerable multi-format success reaching number 11 on the Billboard Modern Rock chart, number 10 on the Dance chart, and number 16 on Adult Top 40. The song rose to number 15 in the UK and number 8 in Shirley's native Scotland. Hearing these songs from the 90s makes me long for those days when we were flipping through each other's CD binders. Remember that? You could pretty much define a person by what they had in their CD booklets. You know, watching Seinfeld and Friends on Thursday nights and arguing about U2's 90s output and picking on boy bands. Those were the days. Anyway, leave us a comment about these songs. What are your memories? Also, what other songs should we cover here on other 90s hidden gems? You can dive into the pool of nostalgia by clicking on our Amazon links below for books, CDs, and shirts. 
If you like our content, click below to subscribe. Make sure to click the bell so you never miss an episode. Check us out on Patreon where you can get even more content. Help us keep the music alive. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Thank you.